Laurie couldn't remember what she dreamed about as a child. Maybe she wanted to be a doctor or a teacher. At the very least, a princess or a fairy. However, when she grew up, she had dreams and hopes. Laurie didn't fantasize about much or about unattainable things. She dreamed of a family, something she hadn't really had since she was seven years old. She lived in a foster family, and life was not sweet. In Laurie's fantasies, her family was close-knit and strong. The kind shown in TV commercials, they smile a lot and gather around one table to share the day's news. This didn't happen in her foster family. Laurie wanted to live in a house and have a dog. She dreamed of seeing the sea, as she had never been there. For a while, she wanted to learn belly dancing after watching Turkish TV series, but then changed her mind. Laurie dreamed of taking a ride in a hot air balloon. She wanted to become an animator who would give the world, and especially children, new cartoon characters. Yes, by the age of 24, Laurie had many hopes for her future. But in no dream, even the strangest and scariest, did she find herself lying on the floor, feeling she couldn't breathe from fear and the pain in her ribs. Laurie curled up in a fetal position to protect her abdomen and the life already flickering inside her. Luke loomed over her. Her husband's face and neck were crimson. He was breathing heavily as if he had run a couple of kilometers. But no, he had just vented his anger on his favorite punching bag, his wife. Don't you dare contradict me again, got it, he snarled, spraying spit. Then he noticed the red stains on the white tiles and grimaced with disgust. Clean it up. Disgusting, he demanded. I won't be coming home tonight. Luke then turned and left the kitchen with long strides. A minute later, the front door slammed. This sound brought Laurie relief. She allowed herself to sob loudly. Hot tears streamed down her cheeks. But Laurie couldn't stay alone for long. She heard the creak of a bedroom door, followed by shuffling, unsteady steps. Laurie had learned to gauge her father-in-law's level of drunkenness by his walk. Right now, Mr. Dart was still in a coherent state. The man stopped in the doorway and stared at his daughter-in-law. Laurie lay there crying. Pride was long gone from her. And who was there to feel ashamed in front of? Her father-in-law. Sometimes she had to wash this nasty, sick old man. Her husband had ordered her to care for and look after him. Luke wanted to inherit his apartment and other property. Mr. Dart stood in silence, then made a strange, croaking sound and shuffled past his daughter-in-law to the fridge for a snack. Why are you still here? the old man sneered. You know this won't end. In a couple of days he'll come with flowers, beg for forgiveness and you'll forgive him. And then you know where he'll bring flowers? To your grave, Laurie. Laurie pursed her lips and slowly stood up. She looked at her father-in-law. He had always scared her. From the beginning he had been rude and cold to her, even when she was just Luke's fiancée. Luke said it was all because of alcohol which missed her. Dart consumed in huge amounts after his wife's death. Once he got so drunk that he couldn't get out of bed to go to the toilet. He got lost in the apartment corridors and relieved himself in the wardrobe. Laurie had to do a massive cleaning job, washing not only the wardrobe but also her father-in-law. And where should I be? Laurie wiped her face with her hand. Her father-in-law threw bread on the table and started looking for a knife. But Laurie had hidden them, not so much from the old man, who could sometimes drink himself into a delirium, but from her husband. She was afraid that one day Luke might get his hands on a knife. You should run away, you fool, the old man shouted. I have nowhere to run. Laurie's voice sounded monotonous like a broken record and these weren't even her words, not her thoughts. This was the mantra her husband constantly drilled into her. Luke's voice still echoed in her head, louder than her own thoughts. 
You're worthless, Laurie. Even your mother abandoned you, didn't she? Your father left because of you too. You've been a nobody since the day you were born. Luke would drill into her mind. Where will you go, Laurie? He would ask mockingly, even joyfully. You have nowhere to go. I'm all you have left. You're pregnant, Laurie, he said later. Who would want you with a child? How could you possibly raise it alone? You're useless. But it wasn't always this way. Yes, Laurie was an orphan, Luke got that right. But she had friends from school. Later she made a friend at college, Peggy, and she had a best friend, Stan. But Luke did everything he could to isolate Laurie from them. He forced her to quit her job and cut ties with her friends. He completely dominated her. Laurie couldn't remember when it all started. Luke seeped into her life slowly and unnoticed, like mold spores, like a weed crowding out everything else. His poisonous influence grew stronger over time. Laurie recalled the first time she felt his jealousy. She had just graduated from university and was job hunting, full of inspiration and enthusiasm. She was getting ready for an interview and put on a skirt that was a bit above the knee and high heels. She wanted to make a good impression, so she styled her hair and put on makeup, of course. Luke noticed this and stared at her for a long time before sneering, Are you looking for a job or a lover? Change immediately, don't embarrass me. And wipe off that war paint, you look like a prostitute. His words surprised, confused, and even offended Laurie. She didn't see anything provocative in her light pink lipstick. But back then, as a young wife, she obeyed her husband. She put on pants and wiped off the lipstick. She got the job. But Luke was insanely jealous of her colleagues and boss. He saw Laurie's boss, a successful and single man, as a threat. So Luke started calling Laurie twenty times a day, disrupting her work. Once, during an important meeting, Laurie turned off her fur phone. Luke stormed into the office. He shouted, demanding his wife. He nearly got into a fight with one of Laurie's colleagues who stepped in to protect her. Someone suggested calling the police, but Laurie just left with her husband. At home, Luke slapped her hard, making her teeth clatter. And then, then he hugged her tightly, telling her how much he loved her and how afraid he was of losing her. Laurie cried and believed him. A girl who had never known the love of a father or any other man thought this was how it was supposed to be. She had to quit her job. She looked for another one, but Luke was against it. Why do you need to work? He grumbled. Stay home? You're my wife. In our family, the woman keeps the home, not stays out late. Besides, with your skills as a designer illustrator, you can work for yourself, not for some stranger. Thus began Laurie's long ordeal. She became a prisoner of her husband, his servant, and later his punching bag. Luke started hitting her when he had problems at work. The issues resolved, but the habit remained. Did Laurie try to fight back? Yes, she did, but all attempts were futile. Things only got worse. Once, when Laurie responded to his insults and raised her voice, he flew into a rage, squeezed her shoulders tightly, and shook her like a kitten then. Then he used his hands and feet. Laurie screamed, pleaded, and then just cried. Neighbors turned up the volume on their TVs to drown out the noise. She suggested that Luke see a therapist, but he got furious and yelled at her. You think I have a problem in my head. The problem is you. If you were normal, I wouldn't touch you. When Laurie first mentioned divorce, her husband got angry and replied, Looking her in the eyes, I won't give you a divorce. I'll kill you. The only way you'll leave me is for the afterlife, Laurie. He said it so smoothly that Laurie's hair stood on end from the horror and realization of the kind of person she had tied her life to. Luke began to control his wife on a maniacal level. He tracked her call and message history, 
checked her browser, and got angry if he saw that Laurie had cleared her search history. He also controlled the money, not giving Laurie an extra cent. For every dollar spent, she had to account. And today he found her stash. Laurie had secretly managed to sell a couple of her artworks. She had illustrated book covers. Initially, Laurie didn't plan to hide the money from her husband, being too afraid of him. However, when the money was in her hands, she couldn't resist the temptation. Somewhere deep inside, she still hoped for a different life, but without money she couldn't even board a bus. But fate did not smile upon the woman it only mocked her attempts to change anything. Luke, who rarely entered the room they decided would be a nursery, decided to look for something there today. An envelope fell out of the dresser, containing the betraying bills. At that moment, Laurie was on all fours scrubbing the kitchen floor since Luke hated dirt. He wouldn't sit down to dinner if he noticed even a drop of grease on the floor. And then, from the nursery, Luke's voice, deceptively calm, reached her ears. Laurie, dear, don't you have something to tell me? He came into the kitchen, waving the envelope. At the sight of it, Laurie immediately went cold and sat on the floor. She began to crawl away from her husband, not even hoping for mercy. It's, it's for the baby, she stammered. Yeah? So, you think I can't provide for my son, is that it? You don't trust me, so you're saving money. And where did you get it? How did you earn it? Laurie tried to explain but inside she felt a bleak hopelessness. She thought that this time she wouldn't cover her head and face as she used to. She would try to protect her belly. Laurie stood up, catching her breath. She wiped her lips, noticing a red mark on her hand. Her husband had kicked her in the lip, then stopped. Laurie came to her senses when the old man started grumbling. Damn it! Where are all the knives? This is still my apartment. Why can't I find anything in it? Laurie moved her father-in-law aside with her shoulder and took out the hidden knife. The old man looked at her from under his tangled grey eyebrows. His gaze was, as always, stern and full of dislike. However, Laurie had gotten used to it. If you think about it, Mr. Dart only looked mean and talked a lot. A couple of times, she remembered, he even stood up for her before his son. He took the blame for some misdeed, knowing that Luke wouldn't touch him. Laurie didn't understand the old man's behavior. He didn't want to be her friend or family. He wasn't nice or kind, but sometimes he was the only one who stayed on her side. After serving her father-in-law, Laurie looked at the floor and wanted to clean up. However, as soon as she bent down, her ribs reminded her of their existence. Laurie exhaled and then hurriedly sat on a chair, unable to straighten up. The old man swore and, rolling up his sleeves, grabbed a rag. What are you doing? I can do it myself, Laurie gasped. Sit down, you fool, the man grumbled, wiping the stains. What a monster he is. In fact, this time he didn't act too brutally. Probably because of my condition, Laurie noted timidly. Laurie was in her third month of pregnancy. She, of course, hoped that the baby would change her husband and he would become softer, kinder. As if reading her thoughts, the old man threw the wet rag on the floor and gave his daughter-in-law a vicious look. You think he'll change? No way. A leopard doesn't change its spots, the man shouted. You know what will happen. I'll tell you. He'll pick you up from the maternity ward with flowers, happy and beaming. For a while, he'll even carry you in his arms, and then it will begin again. If the child gets sick or cries, it will be your fault. When he starts teething, soils the sheets, or draws on the wallpaper, you will be considered a bad mother. He will punish not the son, but you. And the child will observe all this absorbing his father's behavior along with your milk. Then your son will become just like his father. Laurie shivered and touched her belly, desperately trying to save the boy from such a fate. No, she shook her head stubbornly. 
How do you know? You can't say that. The old man suddenly shrank, deflating as if someone had let the air out of his frail chest. He looked away, ashamed and irritated. I know what I'm talking about, Laurie. My son is my copy. I was like that. Because of me, Sarah went to the other world, and it was all written off as an accident. Laurie gasped. The old man shook his head and then collapsed onto the stool as if the confession had drained the last of his strength. I know what I'm talking about, he muttered again. The young woman's heart clenched. Mr. Dart had never been so frank with her before. Then it suddenly dawned on her. Mr. Dart, did you try to drive me away from the family because you knew? She whispered fearfully. The man nodded. I didn't know for sure, but I suspected. It's no wonder all those girls ran away from Luke without looking back. He then looked into his daughter-in-law's face. Run away from here too. Run before it's too late. If not for yourself, then for the child my grandson. Laurie's lips trembled and her eyes filled with tears. Where to? She whispered with a sob. Her father-in-law drummed his fingers on the table. He looked into her face at her swollen lip and tear-streaked cheeks. Then he got up and shuffled to his room. He returned not empty-handed. A towel-wrapped bundle fell into Laurie's lap. What's this? she asked, wiping her tears. Unwrapping the bundle, she gasped. Before her were jewels, brooches, earrings, rings with stones, family heirlooms, the old man snorted. These belong to my wife and grandmother. Sell them at a pawn shop, but don't undersell. There are some very valuable pieces. Sell them and run away from here, understand. Laurie had never seen Mr. Dart so clear-headed and proactive. He seemed to have even rejuvenated, muttering under his breath. This should have been done long ago. Laurie trembled, her vision blurred from a new flow of tears. In her hands was the key to her salvation, but could she muster the courage? He'll find me. He won't if you go to another state. The old man grumbled and handed her a letter and an old photo. This letter. Give it to my friend. Here's our photo. Frankie and I have been friends since the army. Then we worked together. On the back of the photo is his address. He should still be there at his house. He loved his farm so much he wouldn't have traded it for city life. That was ten years ago. I think nothing's changed. I lost touch with him when I buried Sarah and started drinking. But don't worry, he'll help you. Do you think he will take me in? Laurie doubted. The old man nodded. I saved his life once. A bear attacked us and mauled his leg. I saved him and carried him for a long time. So, he owes me. He'll help you. He's the kind of person who won't leave you in trouble. The old man then grabbed Laurie's hand, squeezing it but you need to run now, understand? Run? I know Luke, he's gone for the whole weekend, he declared, looking into her eyes. Run now. If you hesitate, you'll never do it. You'll stay trapped in this hell. But how? I can't even get out without the keys. Her husband did take the keys and lock her in during the day, like a prisoner. The old man shook his head stubbornly. Take my keys and phone. I'll manage, he stated. Laurie's throat tightened. Succumbing to her emotions, she leaned forward and hugged the frail old man tightly. Thank you, she whispered, feeling a spark of hope igniting inside her. She had somewhere to go and the means to live, and she would manage from there. Mr. Dart's shoulders shook. He awkwardly hugged her back and then, after a moment, said, Forgive me. I, I realized too late. I can't undo my mistakes. I'll answer to God and Sarah for my sins. But if I can save someone at the end of my life, let it be you and my grandson. He squeezed her in a brief, strong hug, and then weakly pushed her away. Run, go now. The man turned away, hiding the tears welling up in his eyes. Laurie wiped her face and stood up. Inside her, everything was trembling, coiling like a spring. 
Her palms were sweaty, and she could hardly breathe. Would she really dare to go through with it? Going into the room to grab her things, she paused for a moment. Maybe she shouldn't. Maybe she needed to plan everything more carefully instead of acting on impulse. And then she felt something stir inside her. No, of course the baby couldn't move yet. It was too early. Or could it? However, this feeling, this reminder that a new life was forming within her, made Laurie pull herself together. She gathered all she needed, even found some cash, said goodbye to the grim, drinking old man once more, and then rushed out. Everything that happened afterward felt like scenes from a detective movie. Laurie, hiding her bruises under sunglasses, sneaked into a pawn shop. The crafty appraiser, noticing Laurie's anxiety, smirked and named a small amount. That's all I'll give. You must have stolen all this stuff. Look at you, you're shaking. And it's not even yours, he said. Laurie shook her head. She didn't want her father-in-law's efforts to go to waste for such a low price. Then forget it, I'll find another pawn shop, she said quietly. And then, for the first time in many years, luck smiled upon her. A woman approached her. She turned out to be the appraiser's wife and co-owner of the pawn shop. Why are you intimidating her, she snapped. Can't you see her face? The woman's expression softened, and she spoke gently to Laurie. What happened, dear Laurie, out of fear, blurted out the truth. The woman noticed that Laurie was holding her stomach. She shook her head and barked at her subdued husband again. Calculate everything honestly, she demanded. I'll never do business with you, her husband grumbled. But at least you'll have a clear conscience. And, God willing, you won't end up in hell, you goat-faced idiot, his wife retorted. Laurie listened to the couple's bickering and realized that despite the harsh words, they loved each other. Soon she left the pawn shop with money and the blessing of the kind woman. She even offered Laurie a place to stay for the night, but Laurie refused. She felt her salvation lay in movement. If she stopped, she wouldn't have the courage to see it through. Then came the plane, the looks from other passengers and flight attendants at her face. A few hours of flight, a taxi to a small town, and now she stood in front of the gate of a stranger's house. Laurie checked the address and, taking a deep breath, decided to go in. It wasn't an old man like Mr. Dart who opened the door, but a young man, handsome, broad-shouldered, with wide cheekbones, an open gaze, and curly hair. This was the man from the photograph trembling in Laurie's hands. She blinked realizing how impossible this seemed. Who are you looking for? The man asked. Frankie King? She said softly. Almost he chuckled. I'm his son, Edward. Laurie swallowed thickly and growing more anxious said, I need to see Frankie King. Can I meet him? The man's eyebrows twitched. That's unlikely. Unless you're planning to go to the other side, Edward stated, seeing Laurie's confused look, not appreciating the dark humor. He sighed and explained, my dad's been buried for a year now. Laurie gasped. She didn't know what to do next. Edward, noticing the photo in her hand, was surprised. Oh, I know this man, he smiled. Dad told me about him. He owed him his life. I wanted to invite him to the funeral but couldn't get in touch. Called a few times, but he was out of it, to be honest. Are you his daughter? Laurie shook her head and, unable to explain everything herself, handed over a letter. I'm his daughter-in-law, Laurie, and I need help. Edward's frown deepened as he read the letter. Laurie thought he was displeased that she had come to his home so she started babbling. Please, help me. I came here to Mr. King with nowhere else to go. I'm very hard-working and can help with the household chores. I can clean and cook. I don't need money for it, just a roof over my head. I brought my laptop and can work from home. 
I'll earn money and rent a room as soon as I save up enough. Edward, who was frowning while reading, didn't even think of turning the poor woman away. He looked at her with genuine surprise. Are you planning to work even though you're pregnant, he asked, waving the letter at Laurie. Are you out of your mind? You need to take care of yourself. Come on, go inside and rest from your journey. I was making dinner. We'll eat in half an hour and discuss everything then. Laurie was surprised by Edward's reaction but said nothing, fearing she might scare away her luck. It turned out Edward was a simple, sincere guy. He had been married once but divorced because his wife found someone wealthier. Edward worked as a builder and was beloved in the town for often helping the locals. They quickly and easily started living together. Edward didn't seem at all bothered by Laurie's presence on his property. He talked to her as if she were an old and close friend. Edward joked a lot, helping Laurie, and soon she felt at ease around the cheerful and straightforward man. His house showed signs of lacking a woman's touch, which Laurie fixed, wanting to repay Edward for his hospitality. She cleaned, made the place cosy, and cooked. Edward argued with her, insisting a pregnant woman shouldn't exert herself. Laurie laughed and swore that washing curtains wouldn't kill her. Before she knew it, months flew by. She settled into Edward's house and started working again. Laurie became a remote worker for an animation company in the capital. In the evenings when inspiration struck, she would sit in the living room, legs tucked under her, drawing. Edward would sit nearby either strumming his guitar or reading a book. Laurie didn't notice, but Edward would secretly watch her, admiring her focused expression and the way she stuck out her tongue in concentration, hiding his smile. He realized he was developing feelings for this wonderful woman. Laurie, too, felt herself falling for Edward but suppressed these feelings, thinking he wouldn't want a pregnant, married woman. However, she was mistaken about Edward's character. When Laurie gave birth, Edward personally built and painted a crib for her son, Timmy, and renovated one of the spare rooms. Leading Laurie there, he suggested, you need to get a divorce, Laurie. Stay with me. I'll be a good husband to you and a father to Timmy. Laurie blushed, then felt a wave of fear. I'm afraid of dealing with my husband. He'll find out where I am. Who cares? A man who hits a woman is a coward and a weakling, Edward said. I can handle him. You're not alone anymore, Laurie. I'll protect you and your son. As Laurie expected, Luke refused to agree to a divorce. When she called him, he showered her with curses and threats. I know where you are now, he said during their last conversation. I'll find you and take the child. Laurie was terrified, but Luke didn't get the chance to act on his threats. He got into his car, drunk, intending to drive to the airport. On the way, he lost control and crashed. Mr. Dart, after burying his son, left all his property to his grandson. The old man stopped drinking, lived for a few more years, and even got to dote on Timmy. On his deathbed, he asked Laurie for forgiveness and thanked her for giving him something he didn't deserve a real family. And Laurie? She had a home and a dog named Cooper. She had a loving and hard-working husband, a wonderful son, and later, a daughter. In the summer, they swam in a river that was very much like the sea. Recently, Laurie completed a wonderful cartoon that was about to be released, bringing joy to children. And maybe she hadn't flown in a hot air balloon yet, but everything was still ahead of her. Thank you for listening to the story till the end. Please support the channel with a like. It won't take much effort, but it means a lot to me. See you next time.